venerable religious, your parishioners, this is a call to battle. As I was rereading this extract from the Ephesians, I, it seems to me that there is no passage in Scripture that is more warfare-oriented than today's epistle. We are in a spiritual battle. This is not a battle to stock up on guns and ammunition, swords, switchblades, although people certainly have the right to defend themselves physically. But St. Paul is calling us to spiritual warfare. He describes the spiritual offensive weapons. He describes the spiritual defensive weapons. This is why we're called the church militants. This past Friday, Feast of All Saints, was a wonderful opportunity to reflect upon that consoling, beautiful doctrine, the communion of saints. There's three parts to the church. There's the church triumphant in heaven. We honor the church suffering yesterday in purgatory. And today is we are thinking about the church militant. So beautiful way to illustrate those three parts of the church. We are the militant church because we are in the battle. The souls in purgatory, even they are suffering more than we can imagine. They're not in a battle. They're just through, going through that purifying fire. And our prayers and suffrages can, well, not just can, definitely lessen the time, release them early from their most serious uh, pains that they're going through. But we are the church militant. We have to battle. We may not want to be soldiers. We may not want to go out in the battlefield, but we have no choice because our enemies are not going to go away. Who are our enemies? St. Paul mentions the devil, very obviously one of our most powerful enemies. And he's very smart. He's an angel is far more knowledgeable than any human being. And not only that, the devil's been around for thousands of years. So he can also gain an experience as well. Our greatest enemy, of course, is our own fallen human nature. We can't blame it all on the devil. But certainly very powerful things at work trying to get us away from the worship of the true God. The devil is doing that. Our, our own fallen human nature is going to pull us away from the worship of the true God. And the world, the world is beckoning to us. Be materialistic. Be all wrapped up in the things that we're doing Try to make your heaven here on earth. Be corrupt along with the rest of us. Make pleasure your ultimate aim. That's the world, and that's a very powerful enemy too. So again, whether we like it or not, we're, in, we're on the battlefield. You can somewhat remove yourself from the world. That's what we try to do as Catholics, to to create our own culture here among ourselves, in our parish, so that there's less chance of falling into worldly ways. It's part of being in the world, but not being of the world. So there, we can do some, some real limitation on that. This is what parents have to do, Catholic parents. They have to limit, safeguard their children from the influences of the world. But how do we escape our own fallen human nature? We can't. We carry our nature around every day. And we're not going to run away from the devil either. Even in the holiest places, the devil is going to be there. I'm reminded of a story of a holy person that saw 
a city and saw the devil. And when I say devil, I really mean them in plural. It's not just, you know, one devil. There's countless devils. But in this, this, the, uh, this, this holy person saw the devil sleeping at the gates of the city and he apparently was able to wake him up and say, why aren't you in there sleep, you know, uh, tempting everybody? And the devil just yawned and said, they're already doing what I want them to do. And later on, this holy person saw a monastery of fervent monks, and he said there were so many devils there, the walls were covered with devils. See, you can't keep the devil away. He's a spirit. He can go wherever he wants, wherever God allows him to go. And so even in holy places, The, the one sin that I wanted to focus on today on how to combat it is something we see a lot at this time of the year, something the devil is trying to, you know, inspire people to commit, people's fallen nature tends towards it as well. But I want to talk about the sin of superstition. And at this time of the year, around All Hallows' Eve or more commonly known as Halloween, there's a lot of superstition. Things like, you know, black, don't, don't let a, a black cat cross your path. Don't go underneath a ladder. Or people will use outright superstitious practices like following the horoscope. So let's just review the catechism on this. And the... Um, and I see that there's a close relationship between, idol between superstition and idolatry. And I was, unfortunately, as we saw, and I talked about this last Sunday, in the Vatican, the Pachamama, Amazon goddess, carved wooden idol was brought there. And in the presence of the false pope and other members of his hierarchy, they bowed down in adoration to this. So right there in the Vatican Gardens, the first commandment was most obviously broken. There's no other way to interpret, you know, bowing your forehead down to the ground. That's adoration. And it was given to a false... Um, to a false god, goddess. Now, the excuses were made, oh, this is, this is just a symbol. But they're lying to us. The Amazon says, that is a goddess. But nevertheless, this goddess, this copies of it, multiple copies of it, were featured throughout this Amazon synod. So again, the, the descent into apostasy is most obvious. But let's say for the sake of argument, maybe it was only a superstition, but even that's a sin. The sin is giving to a creature an honor that should be given to God alone. If people believe in a lucky uh, charm of some kind, um, you know, lucky rabbit's foot, they carry around with them, rub it, you know, before difficult things, so, you know, get help, that's superstition. Maybe they're not outright bowing in adoration, but it's still offensive to God because we should get our help from God, not from creatures that have no inherent power at all. You know, our human nature, either consciously or subconsciously, recognizes that we have to worship God. And the human race started off with worshiping the true God, and the true God is invisible. Of course, he became man. The second person became man about 4,000 years after Adam and Eve were, were created. But we know that by his essence, God is a spirit. We worship that almighty spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in the Holy Trinity. 
So the human race started off knowing that and worshiping God as such. But again, the devil being involved, people's own fallen human nature, they put in substitutes for God. They go for something tangible. And whether it be the worst form of breaking the first commandment, idolatry, or the lesser sin of superstition, they're diverting from the worship of the true God. Even with Eve, let's, how did the devil tempt Eve? He says, you know, God doesn't want you to eat from that tree because you will know as God knows. So what he was doing, he was appealing to Eve, make yourself your God. If you know what God knows, you'll be God. And that's how Eve fell from the worship and love of the true God and got her husband, the head of the human race, Adam, to do as well. So as I said, Idolatry is a terrible sin against the first command. We see even the chosen people falling into this. Even as, as Moses is getting the Ten Commandments from God at the top of Mount Sinai, down at the bottom, the golden calf is being worshipped. With, with Aaron, the high priest, being the accomplice how low can people fall? How bad can it get? No wonder Moses, when he came down from the top of Mount Sinai, he, he, he threw the tablets of stone down on the ground, shattering them to show that they had broken the covenant. They had turned their backs on God. They had, were now going to worship something physical, give their respect and trust to something physical and not to the true God. So we must never make the mistake of putting the creature in the place of God. Unfortunately, it's a weakness of human nature to do that. The devil is always going to encourage that. As, we, as I said, he did it with our first mother, Eve, got her to put herself in place of God. We must worship with deep faith and attention and effort the one true God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the three persons in one God. So let, as I said, I wanted to talk about superstition because unfortunately it's very, it's quite rife. Again, people putting their trust in something physical. So what does the catechism say? Besides the sins against faith, hope, and charity, what other sins does the first commandment forbid? It forbids superstition and sacrilege. When does a person sin by superstition? When he attributes to a creature a power that belongs to God alone, as when he makes use of charms or spells, believes in dreams or fortune-telling, or goes to spiritists. You see, going to a fortune-teller or a palm reader, reading tarot cards, that's like Eve. I want to know things that, we're not, that I'm not supposed to know. One of the things we're not supposed to know is the future. We can make good guesses about what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, you'll go to work, your children will go to school. I mean, but, you know, for absolute certainty, we'd like to know. But again, that would be falling into the idolatry that, that Satan tempted Eve with. You will know as God knows. We have to trust God as we go forth into a future that obviously we don't know for sure what's going to happen. A footnote to 
uh, question 212 about the sin of superstition. By its nature, superstition is a mortal sin, but it may be venial either when the matter is slight or when there is a lack of full consent to the, to the act. Often this sin is not mortal when there is question of certain popular superstitions, for example, belief in unlucky days and numbers. I have to just stop here and comment. The number 13. I think one of the silliest things that I've, that's ever happened is when people, when buildings are built and they avoid naming the 13th floor because it would be unlucky. Well, you can't change the, you can call it 14, but it's still 13. And besides, when Our Lady appeared at Fatima, what day did she come on for six consecutive months? The 13th. If that was a bad or unlucky number, I'm sure Our Lady would not have made use of it. So it's not, again, just a superstition. Um, so a belief in unlucky days and numbers or when superstitious acts are performed as a joke without any serious thought of attributing divine powers to a creature or when these are performed for, uh, for amusement. But often venial sin can be there. So it, it's just something to, to avoid. It's just, again, what is the, what's the difference between the creator and the creature? Anything a creature has, is the, anything it can do, it's from God and must be acknowledged as such. So let us again worship the true God. Yes, we're allowed to make use of statues because we are not using them in a superstitious way. We're using them because they remind us of the holy person we are venerating. So that is, there's never a superstition there, or should not be. I'm, and I really doubt that any Catholic would ever fall into that trap. So we honor the statues, but we worship. We want to know, love, and serve the true God and be happy with him forever in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.